Hello and welcome to week 37 of the Foot Weekly Podcast. This is a gameplay episode and I have with me, as I pretty much always do, uh, foot legend Air James. Welcome back. Thank you much, Ben. Glad to be back. Fresh off of uh, 18 and 2. Nice. Uh, League 1, absolute garbage fire, trash, red pick uh, session. So... You know, actually, I guess it wasn't. Gar- I, I guess it wasn't like super hot fire. I got Jonathan David, so oh, um, um, that's not awful. Like, I guess, yeah, yeah it's not value. awful. But mm. when did you get those red picks? That's the question. Uh, yesterday, maybe. Because mm. EA put out a tweet saying they're giving out the red picks again. They are. If you finish before a certain point, when this will come, I don't know. But they didn't have Verratti, Sissoko, and Ben Yedda in there. So oh. yeah. And if you're German, mm. you got some unbelievable packs. Some, I think, 92 plus um, compensation if you opened a certain pack in the store. Yeah, because the description was uh, incorrect. So th- the the teams that you might be facing this quick weekend might have just been juiced to the gills because some of those 92 picks. I think I saw um, pro player Dylan Mike. He walked away with Kevin De Bruyne and Vinicius Junior from his. Uh, his picks, his compensation. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's again because they didn't put loan in the pack description, I guess, in the, the German store. Uh, and that's Richard Buckley, of course. Uh, I'm sure you'll recognize his voice if you've been listening to this podcast for a bit. E-World Cup commentator and E-Champions League commentator too. And we also have with us tutorial and guide legend Neil Guides. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. Thank you for having me on again. Yeah, good, good to have you. And uh, how's team of season been treating you so far? absolute garbage i've not had one <laughs> really? yeah. that i can say oh you know what half decent i've just been getting garbage it's come to the point now i'm just like i can't wow. be able to even play anymore like, i'm just gonna get garbage again mm. do you think uh there was one player that you actually used even from your red picks or were they really that bad one player maybe we'll get on to him later on but apart from that oh. i've not really had that much i mean i tried i was like i was like one weekend let me even get um see if i get that rank five luck still got garbage <laughs> Yeah, I've seen some pretty crazy uh, rank 5 or 9 or 11 win, win luck uh, over the course of this team of the season. But let's get into some uh, little team of the season reviews, I guess. That's what we tend to start with. Uh, Japes and I on the Supporter Content Podcast actually talked for our team, so probably gave plenty of kind of review content out to listeners on that. So we'll start with Neil and Richard. Uh, Richard, why don't you start? Uh, any particular player you wanted to give a review to from team of the season? Well, unfortunately, like... Well, I should say, not like Neil, my red picks have actually been quite good. Mm-hmm. Like Slime was on, I was talking a lot about Ruben Diaz. I got him mm-hmm. red, I've been using him, and I found someone to partner alongside Ruben Diaz now, and it's the red Militao. Oof. Granted, he might, he, might not be, he might not be in everyone's price range, but if you are got the coins to spend on a centre-back, he just is unbelievable. Like, he... He never feels like he's out of position. He's so fast, defending, physicality. He's actually quite good on the ball as well. And for people who are maybe wanting to go to a five back, he can play ultimate position right back. So you can line mm. up him right back, two centre backs, and then a left back, maybe an Alfonso Davies, to then move across to a wing back or even a, a left midfield position. I think he's he's probably top five, maybe top three in the entire game Militao at centre-back I'm a big big fan of his and I was able to get my hands on his teammate in Valverde team Mm. of the season so we're going back a few weeks but Valverde is unbelievable he can play nearly everywhere on the pitch I've been using him right wing back I've been using him centre mid I've been using him right wing like he is so so good I think in this current style of FIFA we're playing now players who can play different positions is very important and he's the ultimate person for that I just mm. so so well versed and mm. um, again a little bit expensive but if you're able to uh, to pick him up you got him as a maybe an untradeable in your in your upgrade pack grind you have to get him involved mm. he's, he's been a pain to play against did you get anyone a bit cheaper that's worth worth mentioning I, I, I liked Klaus I use Klaus a little oh, bit. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Especially in the league and team of the season cup. He was playing zero chemistry right mid just to get a player in that position. Really good. And I've come to the the realization that a four star skiller out wide, especially in the box, everyone always says, like, how do you how do you score on the byline, etc.? All you need to do is just do the 
the ball roll heel to heel and you'll send the goalkeeper into ridiculous animations every single time. Mm. So um, it, I didn't really use it in that position a lot, that skill move. But especially after watching a bit of Harry Hesketh just grinding out 20 and O's with every single team on stream, he will do that nearly every time. And Klaus, he um, if you're playing that back five, wing back, getting forward, he's very, very nice in that position. So you're saying you get to the byline and then you and perform then do it? The, Go yeah. in, go inside, basically inside the pitch yes. and round the keeper. And either you'll get a corner, or the goalkeeper will go down in animation, and you'll just walk past him. Mm, nice. I need to give that a try. Actually, I've not really been doing it myself. I know you can like pull it back with like R one or LB or whatever, and sometimes the keeper just kind of falls on the floor. But it's not as probably consistent as that. Uh, nice. Um, and then Neil, what about you? Any particular players that uh, you've been using, even though they may not have been red picks, or or maybe this one is? I don't know. I actually, so as soon as I saw that Saka card, um, that card is probably my favourite card. Mm. I'm really playing predominantly in midfield, but he can play left wing, right wing, left back, right back in a 5-2-1-2, or left wing back, right wing back, should I say. Um, so he's definitely one of my favourite cards on the team that I purchased. One of the red picks I did get was Frimpong. I never really had a Bundesliga mm. team, but what I was doing was, is I was actually just subbing him in for centre mid, because I kind of wanted someone that was agile, high, high, box to box. And to be honest, he's done a fair good job. He's one of those players where like, I used him there for a bit. Then I was like, okay, let me replace him. And then no one could do the job that he did. Mm. And you know, you just feel like I need to put that player back in a team. And Frimpong was that uh, player for me. Did very, very well. Good on the ball, good sprint speed and agility and balance. Uh, so I actually really like him. So he kind of plays that defensive, but also kind of box to box role. I like to be a bit more attacking, a bit more risky but it's more fun at this stage of FIFA. Yeah, his stats for a midfielder do actually look really quite good. And uh, James, I know we talked about a lot of players on the content podcast this week, the supporter episode, but is there anyone else you want to chuck into the mix maybe you've used since then? Yeah, I um, I got my red picks for Liga and got Jonathan David. And he is really good. Like, really good. Mm. I'm playing him just on like one chem because... He gets a little Alfonso Davies chem. I thought about trying to force more chem with Remy Cabella uh, and playing him as like a wing mm. back, but I was like, I just am not doing this. And I need to keep my defenders on higher chem. I need the Bundesliga manager. So I couldn't, you know, do like a league uh, manager shuffle for him. But mm. if he is like pretty stellar. He's got just because he's got like so many base 99 stats. And I like mm. it, it, he's his he's one of those that his price is just going to keep going down. I would imagine. Mm. I, you know, I'm I'm a little surprised that how like what he's rated or excuse me how expensive he is given the state of the chemistry system or like how it prioritizes players. And mm. I would say Leal was like okay for team of the season, but not like not not great. Yeah. Like I'm nobody's nobody's getting jazzed about using Andre. Let's be real about that. Yeah, he didn't even make my Tots Cup team yeah. to be honest, Andre. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's a funny one. I guess Davies is probably helping for chemistry, isn't it, uh, for a lot of people? And then if you have a couple of other league gun players, that that could help, couldn't it? And there's also a Canadian manager in the game now who's is very there? very hard to get. I imagine. Actually, to get I don't him, think but... that matters if you have Davies. No, it doesn't matter if you have Davies, but if you don't, it's pretty big. You got uh, it. It's interesting, actually. I was going to mention Marquinhos, who is very good. And is someone that having him untradeable, I'm going to use him when it makes sense to use him for chemistry. But he really is notably not nearly as good as the faster, lengthy centre backs that you can get out there. And with so many centre backs having max defensive stats, the fact that he has max defensive stats and is very good otherwise, it's not really going to compensate for the fact that he's either high pace or lengthy. I actually packed Marquinhos and uh, I packed him tradable, which was really nice. And I used him for maybe 10 games and just took the coins and I put Saliba back in and I, yeah. I genuinely don't think there's any difference between my... I actually, dun, 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 dun. Saliba's <laughs> probably a bit better because of how big he is. Like it feels yeah. huge in defense. You know, I, I I was talking about this on the when we were going through our teams. You know what it is? Saliba feels like he's got Vieira legs. Yeah, it's funny because he is really good, but still, we're just missing those max pace, lengthy centre backs to 
catch or keep up with Max Pace, Lengthy Kane and uh, players like that. But uh, let's move on to some tactical chat. Now, we're not going to speak yet again too much about three and five at the back, but as we haven't had you on before, Neil, how would you recommend countering three and five at the back? In terms of what's the best against five backs, recently something I've been trying actually is I've been playing the three, four, two, one, um, but I've been keeping all three of the strikers on, on stay forwards and the left mid and right mid on comeback and defense. But I use the left mid and right mid on free roam when they're attacking. It's pretty good. And sometimes if someone's got like a three back formation, just a bit of a kind of more of a risky but fun thing to do is I put like all the attackers on stay forward. So of course, defensively, it's quite hard hard to defend against it. But the idea is when you win the ball back, you've got three players on stay forward and the left mid and right mid are there as well uh, to pass the ball to. So that's what I've been doing as well. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I've been playing a 3 4 2 one myself and feel like it is pretty effective against five backs. Um, and I do have the left forward, right forward positions on stay forward as well. And the left mid and right mid I have on, not free roam, but I have them on uh, come short, which does, I guess, do a similar thing. It kind of pulls them inside of it. Uh, I also find that quite useful for defending a counter attacks because they're kind of in a better place to pick up uh, the counter and defend it. So yeah, I do think people could have a 3-4-2-1 to, to counter some of the five at the backs if they're maybe playing a tactic, which is um, a four at the back. I think particularly the 4-3-2-1 I found is a, a formation that really struggles against three at the back formations. But it is a pretty effective tactic itself. I noticed recently though, you, know, you released a 4-2-3-1 guide, right? Not too long ago. So is that something you're still finding quite good and people could try if they want something a bit different? I do sometimes use the the four two three one that I released. Um, it's the one where the centre back becomes an attacker. Mm. You can only really use that really during team in a season time. But that one is really really good. It's it's kind of hard. I mean, because I've had garbage red picks, um, I'm not really been that lucky. But it's kind of hard to find that play that can do that role. But the good thing with that one is you can control that with a D pad. I think that's very much an underrated uh, tactic. Um, mm. People always look at it and be like, "What on earth is this? Like, why would I want a centre back during the attack?" But when you can play a 4-2-3-1 with an extra striker, it, it does make it a bit different. Because one thing I found with the 4-2-3-1 is that with just one striker, especially at this stage, everyone playing five back, it's really hard to get through with. So mm. that is one thing. Or otherwise, the 5-2-1-2 I've been having fun with as well recently. So do you need the centre-back to be very competent in the attack, basically? So when I rigid that formation, it was with, um, I think it was FIFA 20, was that Mendy card. Oh, the Summer Heat one. Yeah. Yeah, that one. And it worked exceptionally well. But you basically need someone that can play as like a, at least a centre forward. Mm. So they need to be good going forward, basically. So I know some people put Ramos there, but I'm yet just to find someone that can actually get the job done properly there. So I've just been kind of experimenting. Um, like I'll dump like sometimes Saka there for Benz to see what's going on. I've not really found a player yet. I've not really got that many coins at the moment. Um, but the key thing is that you need someone that's got higher tech and work rates. And sometimes the game doesn't send them forward. So you ideally need someone that's got good attack and stats. Otherwise, if you activate the D-pad tactic, sometimes the player doesn't go forward. Mm. So that's one thing to bear in mind. And I guess you're hitting it on the D-pad. So you can't choose when to do it. You're not like, you know, if you're two goals up or a goal up, you're not going to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't leave it on. So the real idea behind it is that you'd use it and then when you're attacking, you would do it and then that player will come from deep okay. while you're attacking and then you time it. And then basically, because it's a, no one expects that player to be in that position. And then when you when they're attacking, they just linger around that area. But against the 4 2 three, one, no one expects that player to be there. So sometimes they might get an attacking opportunity or you might do a one 2 to strike or something like that. And that is why you need someone that can shoot as well and get the job done. Hmm. So you kind of need someone that can... A, that's got pace to get from the defense to the attack quickly. And B, you need someone that can actually, of course, shoot the ball or pass the ball or dribble. Mm. So trying to use someone clunky like a um, like a Komen, I wouldn't really go with, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Because I was going to say, someone who'd probably be perfect, but it's very expensive. Although there are cheaper versions, is Lothar, right? Even his, um, the new car, the was it foot birthday. Yeah, that one would be course. perfect. But yeah. yeah, I guess the others wouldn't be too bad there either but uh, not so good yeah no, that's a really interesting one and, and something that I guess like you know when people are trying to break down packed defences three five at the back yeah, once they're set up 
is just like a nice thing. And maybe actually something that people could do even in their regular tactics, right? If they want to just have an extra player in the final stages of a game. It, like, it, it does get a bit sticky because then, you know, on the defensive phase, you don't have that player. Like it's not a native center back unless you have someone like Mateus so or you got the money to do that. But mm -hmm. I'll be honest, if you're struggling like against a five back, you're better off just going to like a three, four, two, one. Mm. That's kind of my advice, to be honest, because you have like five attackers, five versus five. At least you got the best chance of going forward, to be honest. Yeah, and I guess like a lot of centre backs are not great at shooting. Richard, yourself still playing the what was it you playing before? Was it five four one or was it? It's all about the five four one. The reason that it's so strong, and sometimes you'll play against people who seem to be better in the five four one. It's all about the width. Like I think I'm down playing on eight widths now on the offense. So you just make the, the pitch, like you bring people in basically. Mm. So I'm watching a few pros and they basically, majority of them, if they play off back five, will all play on one width, mm. just making the pitch as, as narrow as possible. It might be a, a hot-ish take, but I actually, the four three two one, in my opinion, is the, it's the best formation on the game for people who are just like quickly wanting to improve at FIFA. Mm. You can play the 4 3 2 1, you can play it for 10, 15 games. As soon as you start to learn the passages of play and where the, the, your players will be, I, I genuinely think you will get 5 to 10% better at FIFA. In the 5 4 1, the, like, the main benefit is you're just, you're just harder to concede. But you don't score that many goals because you've not got that many attackers. Also, elite 4 3 2 1 players are. Like the best players on the yeah, game. they are. They feel without doubt. The formation is so good, but the difference in players that like under like truly understand what the formation is trying to do and can like I don't know put their rubber stamp and their own style on it are so like I, I usually play one a weekend that I feel like I have the potential to get absolutely thrashed this game. Yeah. Definitely. I'll have games where I play against someone much better than me uh, in the four three two one, and I'll be like two or three down within the first 20 minutes. And it's the only formation, I think, where that happens. Um, and if I can spot it and like be aware of what they're trying to do in terms of releasing those forwards, like, I, I tend to be okay, but it's still a tough match. Um, but yeah, it can blow you away. Four three two one players with Harry Kane are... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you anyone with Harry Kane is a pain. A, you just know you're going to have a really bad time. I always say just to add on to that as well. I think when I'm okay, I think that's the formation I probably struggle with the most, probably more than five four one. I think I agree with Rich as well. You know, when you're saying that for most players, like to five four one, in my opinion, this is why I don't really advocate the five four one. I'm one, I think it's a bit ratty, but number two, it's like I think if you're like a rank three player, I think that's the kind of person where a five four one might help them edge towards the end where they know how to kind of abuse the game away, they know what to do down the wings. But if you give the five for one to an average player, let's say like a rank, like let's say a rank five player, or rank six, in my opinion, with one striker, still sinking goals they as will well. struggle. Yeah, you're still conceding. Yeah, and they're still conceding because they don't know how to defend. So they're actually being more defensive. And um, the problem is, is that most people can't defend with a back three when the when you go forward in a three back or a five back. So that's why I personally feel that the five for one, yes, it's the best formation yet, but you have to have that understanding of the of the game. Like you, because if you if you give an average player five for one, they might not know, for example, to go down the wing and how to use the wingers, and they might not know how to do that. But if you give someone a four three two one, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. You literally just kind of just tap the L one button. Something you need to do that. Tap the L one button and just kind of just driven past spam to the strikers. And sometimes because you've got three guys in the middle, even if you've got a uh, five back. You can struggle with it. And that's probably the biggest thing I struggle with is when I lose the ball, they get the ball and they pass the ball straight to attack it. Even if I yep. try my best to defend, sometimes I just can't defend against it. Then also defensively, you have a four back. So you kind of got the cracked attack, but also the stability of the defense at the same time. Yeah. And uh, I should say all these formations uh, we've discussed, I'm pretty sure, Neil, you'll have a guide for them if people want to give them a try. We are going to take a break though, and we'll be back with more gameplay advice in just a moment. Hello, listener. If you'd like more for weekly content this week, then the supporter content episode is the place to go. And you can also listen to plenty of other episodes if you fancy supporting over on the Patreon. You get double the podcast content every week, an extra episode 
And uh, yeah, it really keeps the podcast going. And at the moment, it's a great time to sign up because there is that 36,000 FIFA point giveaway, which, yeah, you have a pretty decent chance of winning compared to most giveaways, actually. So check that out if you would like to. Just type in bit.ly slash TOTS in capitals 23. Or you can follow the link in the description of this podcast or just search support for weekly. It really does make a huge difference. It keeps the podcast going. And, uh, you know, there used to be a time when the Foot Weekly podcast couldn't be done weekly. And now it can, in fact, twice weekly for supporters. If you are one of those supporters, a huge thank you for supporting. And if you're considering it, a huge thank you too. Right, let's get back into the podcast with part two. Hello and welcome back after the break. Here's a question from AdsH2K. He says... Question for the Gameplay Pod. That's this podcast. That's handy. What is the difference between a player who gets, say, 9 to 11 wins in foot jumps versus one who gets 14 to 16 wins? Would you say there is a major jump in quality between these two sets of players, or is it just small things that can be easily added to your game to make the jump up? I think we're all in agreement that it really is a different level in quality between particularly, say, 9 to 14 wins or 11 to 16 but I'd be interested to hear kind of advice, especially as Neil, a lot of your content does actually uh, revolve around improving players between those brackets. So what would you recommend people try and what is the difference, I guess? I'm, I'm going to say more 9 to... Let's say we did 9 to 14, because I think to 16 is a bit of a different different level, mm. in my opinion, personally. But in terms of 9 to 14, in my opinion, it's just the pure basics. I think the difference is, is that most people, they lose because of frustration or they have a bad game and then it, let, it lets them kind of, it gets to them. Mm. And to be honest, you all get frustrated with FIFA. And I think the, the thing is, even if you start like a really bad weekend, like if someone normally gets nine to level wins, if you start a really bad weekend league, they will normally make it back just because of the players that you will eventually face. Mm. Um, that's how people kind of get stuck. But in my opinion, it's not about skill moves. I think... If you can learn to do the basics and you don't do them well and consistent, I think that's the thing. It's the consistency. Yeah. What are you what are you qual or classifying as the basics? Okay, so I'll give an example. Like something is so basic as run not not running out with your center backs. And I think the problem is that FIFA is one of those weird games that when a casual sees a pro player doing it, when a pro is doing it, they they're doing it very, very smartly. They're not just running out with their center backs. They're trying to create a trap or they're using teammate contain and they're using someone else to cover the space. But I think with an average player, they're trying to get better at the game. They see these pro players running out with their center back and they think, oh, that's what I need to be doing. And then they'll see, for example, these guys, people are saying, don't run out with your center backs. So the reason why I say it is because I find a lot of these players, they would maybe make a perfect game, like maybe 50% of the time, right? But realistically, you run out with your center back just once against someone who knows what they're doing, who's, who does like an L1 trigger to like a striker, then they can see that goal and then it gets to them. So I personally believe when you're trying to bridge that small, I'm just going to say not, not 11, 9 to 16, I think that's a big, too much of a jump. But like, let's say the 9 to 11 wins to, put to 14, in my opinion, it's all about just doing the basics very well and trying to not get frustrated. I think that's the key. Just taking a break and just look back at your gameplay. Because every, every time someone loses a game, they always say, oh, the game is screwing me over. But the truth is, when you watch back your gameplay, watch it back 30 seconds before the moment happened. Did you What did you do with your midfield there? Did you run out? Did you make the mistake early on? And that's where you can see it. Because I think when you lose one game, then they end up losing four in a row. But realistically, someone who's getting 16 wins, they may lose one game or they may lose two, but not going to be losing four games in a row. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Actually, watching back games, you don't even necessarily need to record it. You can go watch the goal, right? Uh, the, the highlights at the end of the match. It doesn't go back that far though, does it? But you can at least sometimes in that sea where you actually went wrong? I would personally, especially if you're on PlayStation, you're lucky. I don't. I think if Xbox might be the same, but on PlayStation, um, you just press share and then you can record and it, it gives you options, one minute, three minutes, five minutes. But I also record it earlier than you think because at the end of the game, you're right, you can see sometimes what you did wrong, but sometimes what you did wrong was in midfield mm. where you're outnumbered. For example, you decided to be aggressive with your center mid for no reason, your last CDM or your last center mid. And that's where the issue lied, not really in the final in the final section. That's what I'd say. But yeah, 
both of them are good, but if you're on, I think Xbox, you can do the same. I'm yeah, not too can, sure if you yeah, can yeah, pretty, yeah. get the last three minutes. I think you could before. Yeah, Richard, what do you make of this? Because I think, you know, you're going to come up against players of, of different calibers across, say, champs and other things that make it quite easy when you're facing a player you think is probably around the kind of 9-11 win mark. A lot of it is mental. Like, the difference between 9 and 11 wins is literally maybe a penalty shootout win maybe keeping your composure in a game, try to keep hold of the ball for a little bit longer. I, I was watching someone play the other day, a, a streamer, I can't remember who it was, and, and they had people in their chat who were like good level players, rank one, elite division, and they were sort of like doing a live coaching like session, and the only thing, I think this the streamer I think was probably ranked four, ranked five, so yeah, 11, 14 wins, and the only thing they just kept on saying was just play the 100% passes. Like, stop mm. giving the ball away unnecessarily because when you're playing against people who are decent at the game, they will spot that you're giving away the ball and then they will start pressing you into making more mistakes. If you could just settle in, very similar to what a team would in real life do if you're coming up against a, in a, in a big game, you, very rarely do you see teams throw bodies forward or try and kill the game off early. You will settle into it. But I, I really, I just think it's a lot of it is mental, like keeping composure. You've got now five days to play champs if you play now. Amazing. Don't play them all on Friday. Keep keep play a couple a day. Like it, play around like non peak times. If it play when it suits you. If you're in the mood to play FIFA, play a few games. If not, don't play, and don't put pressure on what you're trying to do. Just play the game. Like As soon as you start putting extra incentives on it, you will play worse. Do either of you guys actually look at how many wins you're on as you're progressing? I will only do it when I'm streaming and someone goes, what's your record? And then I'm like, oh, it's this. And I'll clock it. A lot of the time, I will just play. Yeah. I, mm. I like don't realize where I'm on until probably like the very end. As soon as I start thinking about it, I lose. Mm. like that's just how it goes like the the one period I think it was uh, I was 28 to 0 back in 30 games and um, I'm there playing the game and genuinely I'm in the match I'm 1 0 up and I'm already thinking about putting my 30 0 tweet up and I went on to lose the last two games <laughs> that's, and I'm like, that's so true I've, yeah. I've thought about that and now I've lost like as if I just keep calm and just play the game I win those games like that guy's not better than me it's just a 50-50 match and I'm literally already thinking about Oh, this tweet's gonna do good. Like, I'm, this gonna get some engagement, and I've lost. <laughs> and now, twenty-eight tweets like impressive. But it's so true, isn't it? As soon as you think about the fact you're getting that next level that you haven't actually got, that's when you start losing, and you, you that you lose the edge. Basically, you you kind of feel like you're already home, and you're not. You know, the way I look at it is, is that yeah, people look too much, and you, that's everyone is saying. Look, you got five days to play champs now. The best thing ever. Just play two or three games, and then if you if you lose a game, just play it tomorrow. Or if you really want to be serious about it, warm up in rivals one or two games and then go to chance, play what two or three games and then play the next day. That's the way that I would do it. But I think the problem is someone, they lose a the game, then they get very frustrated. Then they go next game and they go start the game with constant pressure or whatever. And they throw the game away. But the truth is in champs, you have to play slow. Um, it's only 20 games now. Like it's not like 40 games back in the day. Maybe you can argue the level was different then. But it's not like you have 40 games in a row. You have only 20 games to play. So I just say, just look, as soon as you lose, just take a break. If that means you play another day, you play another game. But don't just say, oh, you know what? Let me try to recoup and win the next game because I was on a four win streak and I lost this one. Let me try because now it'll be a disaster. Mm. So that's kind of my opinion on that. That's why I say it's all about consistency. It's all about not getting frustrated, taking a game slow. Which you're saying, making sure you play the guaranteed passes because most goals, in my opinion, are like, that rank level are conceded because they lose the ball by passing the ball from a centre mid to an attacker and then the opponent counters them very quickly. That's where I would say most of the goals are conceded from, in my opinion, at that mm. level. And that's just due to mistakes. Playing a risky pass when you shouldn't. Yeah, especially when... Uh, I notice this when people post gameplay clips in the supporter Discord. They have a clip of them where they're you know, maybe down a few goals or a goal and it's clear that they've got frustrated and... As a result, their gameplay isn't patient at all. They've got plenty of time left, but they're still forcing passes into their striker. They're 
uh, maybe trying to run at players when they don't need to. But the biggest thing is just not using the pivot player, not passing back and around. They just try to drive it into their striker or forwards constantly and it's getting picked off. It's quicksand, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It can be a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. You go into a game thinking you're the inferior player, so you feel rushed in the final third and then you concede and that happens again. And then in your next game, you're also still thinking about that last game and you, you then go to try and force it, sprinting all the time, that sort of thing. I wrote a newsletter like kind of all about this because I used to be super susceptible to it. And the like idea of quicksand where like the more you struggle, the deeper of like a hole you get yourself in. Mm. And it's it's very much the same thing when people are like struggling for wins. If your mindset is you're thinking in the next five games, I have to go, I can, I can lose two games. Mm. You're going to be desperate in the games that you go down a goal in for it not to be one of those two games. And in the games that you're winning, you're going to make some probably really poor decisions, like trying to just keep the lead. Like when you maybe could score an extra goal and you just, I don't know, I'm going to just uh, keep possession here, even if it's like an open pass. Like I see people, I see people that could put games to bed often don't do it. Mm. Do you ever find yourself in a game where you can picture your opponent? Because I do that all the time. Like I, I can tell when someone is needing that totally. win just they're like desperate. how they start playing mm. they're bringing on the loans off the bench like everything and i'm just like i can tell you need this win so i'm not i'm keeping the ball i'm frustrating you to the 10th degree like because i know that your mental shot completely and i can also tell when i'm playing against someone who is just better at fifa than me like they're laughing like mm -hmm. i'm i'm out here getting battered by them and they're not even thinking about it so i think it's very interesting like we almost forget sometimes that you're playing against someone else. Like there's another human sat with a controller playing. Like people get into this mindset of I'm playing like the game or the game's doing me wrong. Yeah, but if you if you blame the game, you don't have to blame yourself. <laughs> like it's so you don't have to say someone is better than me. Yeah, yeah. If you're saying the game is against me. Yeah, I mean that's the biggest thing. Like when you're saying things like that you're essentially admitting that you don't have control and yes it's very hard to control a football simulator that's just the way they're built essentially but if your opponent has more control than you then there's a good chance you're not going to be winning that match and that doesn't mean necessarily controlling the ball and having possession constantly it's actually having control of your opponent to some extent and being able to anticipate what they're going to do and some people play in a way that is controlling but they're counter-attacking because they can control you and they make you play risky passes they pick you off and then they counter right so control is crucial and i think to make that step up you do need to have that control you're not necessarily having to control against players who are much better than you all the time but the more you try to do that it will give you an edge in future matchups. And actually that control, what I mean by that is if you think of yourself as almost like, I don't know, a Modric or a Scholes and you dictate the tempo of the match, not only in terms of killing momentum, perhaps if your opponent's just scored, keeping the ball in that situation can be good for that. But also if you win the ball back in your own defensive third and you're thinking, I could counter here, you need to think, well, actually, can I count here? Because a lot of what I see from players who are maybe at that 9-11 win bracket is trying to take counter opportunities when they're just not there and then handing control to their opponent very easily by doing that. And it's not just picking your opportunity to counter. It's also when you get the ball and, as I was saying before, you get it into the final third, taking your time not playing risky passes and showing you're in control of the match. And it might be difficult against better opponents, of course, but you'll be practicing, you'll be improving at it, you'll create opportunities. And it's important to say you, you do need to bring players forward to do that. A lot of negative tactics out there will suggest you don't, but unless you're doing loads of manual runs and things like that, you do need those players involved to work the ball around, use those pivots and eventually you'll find that it gets easier and easier, becomes something that allows you control in games against players who are better and better. And I think that is really how you improve properly, if you like. And part of the question was, you know, should you use exploitable mechanics? And I guess the current kickoff glitch would be an example of that, and whether that's a good idea. And I, I guess I would almost certainly say, no, it isn't. And 
it's not going to help you massively, Neil. I think even if you learn this kickoff glitch, right? Most people have to defend against that. You literally just run back. And the truth is, look, you can learn it now. Or like the ball scoop, you can learn and abuse it now. But you have to ask yourself, are you the same FIFA player every single year? Are you always getting the same rank or are you improving? And that's the difference between someone that improves from, for example, like let's say division 10 to elite division, like the rank sevens and eventually get to rank twos is, are you improving? Because these small things that can help you here and there, but is that making you a better FIFA player? Like that's, yeah. that's the question you have to ask yourself. So in my opinion, look, if you want to be a good FIFA player, learn the basics. Then when you got the bases in check, then you can start adding all these mechanic abuses or give, give everything else to give yourself the edge. But learn the basics first. That's the most important thing. And in my opinion, most players, they don't really know the basics, if you're asking me. The other thing, Richard, that I think does make a difference, and I think the people who get the highest wins certainly do these things and can make a difference no matter your level, I suppose, is seeing out games and kind of being a bit cynical towards the end of matches and I know that's something uh, you specialize in so <laughs> any any particular kind of bits of advice that uh, you give on that because it's definitely something that's important. he specializes <laughs> in it. oh my goodness the master of the dark <laughs> arts I, I am very very good at just I don't I don't even know what, like, it's like game just, management isn't it yeah you just don't take the risk like there was a I had a game this weekend where I was 2-1 up started getting constant pressed my opponent, I could tell he's throwing bodies up the pitch. I managed to play out. And instead of, it was the 89th minute. I know 90% of the games you're going to play, you're going to get plus one. Mm. I went forward with Alfonso Davis. I doubled back, launched it back to the goalkeeper, and then just held it. You do the things that you just have to do. Like It all depends how much you value that win. Yep. Do you care if you go to extra time? Well, I don't want to go to extra time. I want to get my games done. I want to win. I'm going to do what I need to do. Like it's yeah, it's very much the case of like you just do do what you need to do. Yeah, it's one of those things where people are like, oh, this player scored in like the 95th minute. That was only meant to be two minutes of added time, and it's like that's because you've let him come forward. I always think, well, Richard Buckley wouldn't be allowing that, would he? There's no way that player's getting the ball. And I'll be honest, it gives me a very, it gives you a massive sense of enjoyment <laughs> when I, I get a message after the game and all it reads is I can tell you right now I'm pulling it up you, you don't deserve to play this game I put GG follow me on Twitter for more tips <laughs> and it just gives me so much enjoyment yeah I'm not someone who's ever really gone for that approach but like I, I like to just kind of attack the whole time because I find it more fun but I never really hold it against someone who does that because it's part of real football like it is just part of the game and like, it, you know you, you can yourself do that if you want to but you know it's going to get you more wins not everyone wants to do it but the last thing on this I genuinely think there's a, there's, this, there's a lot of skill needed because yeah, yeah. when you are getting pressed like a lot of the time if, if I'm playing and someone's doing that against me every single player goes forward and I would say 70% of the time I get a goal back and then we, we're back to level. Like, there's a, a decent amount of composure needed more than anything rather than skill to actually see games out. Mm. Is the main thing you do is play back to the keeper and then look for the free man from there? Uh, uh, last resort, last resort is ever going back to the keeper. Okay. I will go back to the keeper when I see like 89, 90 and I know I can run around in my box with a goalkeeper and then launch it out for a throw-in. Mm. I'm giving away all the tips. <laughs> all right, Rich. Here, here's the real question that people want to know because we've we've all played against a Richard Buckley. Yeah. Before, he's seeing the game out. When your opponent switches to which formation, does it cause you the most problems when you're doing that and you're playing a five back? Probably four triple two, just because he can almost man mark all my five defenders. Like the switch of play is your ultimate get out ball from like wing back to wing back. If he goes to that four triple two and pushes his wide cams on, it's it's just annoying. Like it's really annoying because you don't really have an option, especially if the two DMs push in. the The best way to get out of the press really is try and wait for him to come up or your opponent to come to approach, and then if you're playing a five four one or something with wide players, a little chip back down the line to like if you've got it with left wing back to the left mid. And that will almost take everybody out of the press and then you've got the opportunity to either go forward or come back. But yeah, 4 triple two is uh, it's nice for pressing. There you go. 4-2-4 as well, I'd say. It's 
big yeah. tracks formation. A favorite color yeah, formation. It's really good. I think a four three three four is quite underrated. You know the one with the two CMs, Cam left wing, right wing striker. You know what? You can't even still the um, the Cam helps if somebody's trying to like pass it, like break your line at all, like through the like a central mm. midfielder. Your striker is still stuck in no man's land between two center backs and a keeper. So you can't actually get in between the passing lanes in the triangle. Yeah, yeah. It's less good for actually pressing, but it is, uh, I find, helpful having the cam for breaking someone down. Just to close things out, Neil, a final tip, if someone is doing a Richard Buckley, like what are your go-to strategies for, for stopping that? In, in terms, so I would say realistically, I normally go for like something of a 4-4-2, 4-2-4. Like any of the 4-4-2 formations yeah, are very yeah. good to get the ball back. They're the best formations for pressing. Realistically, constant pressure does most of it for you. So I normally go to like a 4-2-4. And if you are good at using um, teammate contain, the key thing is trying to trap your opponent, trying to force them to make a mistake. It would depend. Like with Richard Buckley said, he rarely goes back to the goalkeeper because he's a good player. He's used to maneuvering the ball in midfield and kind of getting out of those tricky situations, but not all players are. So when you go constant pressure, a lot of players, they panic, they don't take a touch away. They try to take a no look pass. And that's the key way. So if you can try to get them in their half, try to get them high up the pitch, probably the best way of trying to get them. But I'll be honest, sometimes it's quite hard. If someone's really good at holding the mm -hmm. ball and they know what formation to play, sometimes yeah. you've got no also, chance. I think it's a good idea. If you have someone like, I don't know, Alexis Sanchez, for example, who's actually a very good presser, or I guess uh, Jake's favorite, Martinelli, right? High aggression. Yeah. And subs. Ability to, yeah, and, and yeah. making subs is just so big. Was it five subs now, right? Yeah. And if you get, yeah. Extra time you get six, one extra one. So just, I normally, so if I'm really losing, um, it, it kind of a weird one. I normally bring on two center backs because uh, I find that they lose stamina so bad. So if, if I'm two one down, I don't want to, or three one down, I don't want to end up going another goal down myself. So I kind of bring on two defenders, kind of something that I do, bring on two, because the way I play. And also I can press with my centre-backs quite high and then I try to change the midfield. And if I've got like a key strike on, like a Eusebio, for example, I always try mm. to keep him on. Um, but then I try to put the left mid and right mid on, the players that really do the main pressing, the centre mids, yeah, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Here, let's play. Are you bringing on actual centre-backs at centre-back or are you bringing on outside-backs? I bring on mm. full-backs at that point. Just because I've I've always because the way I press I normally be extremely aggressive with a centre back, um, but I need someone that's fast enough to do that. But if I'm using constant pressure for like I don't know like or let's say it's like seventy minutes and I have got normal stamina kind of use, I'm normally quite aggressive with those players. They have like 50, 60 percent, and I find that if I go constant pressure straight away with those players, they just mm. get killed. Like one through ball in behind because I've overcommitted and I don't that player hasn't no, yeah. got enough pace to recover. Schlatterback and Saliba are not stamina monsters. Yeah. So I often find that I'm <clears throat> I'm considering whether or not I should uh use a substitute for them. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I do sometimes bring a fullback on at centre back at the very end of the game. Um I think it, I think it is a good shout, yeah. yeah especially with team and season um, cards. Definitely go for high defensive work rates as well. I would say yeah, try that, to that's get a good one. Point. Yeah, yeah. That's the that's the guarantee that you need to have at least high defensive yeah, work yeah, rate for that card. Right. I think we're ready to wrap up. A lot of informative discussion on this podcast. And yeah, interested to know what specific things might have helped people if you do find it helps. And if you've got any more questions on this sort of thing, then of course send them in all the usual ways at Foot Weekly Pod on Twitter, footweekly at mail.com, or in the pod priority questions channel in the supporter Discord. Right. Neil, it's been great to have you on this podcast. Thank you for all the uh, tips you've given and people can find plenty more on your YouTube channel, of course. Hey, thank you very much for having me on. I really, really appreciate being on. Good conversation as usual. Yeah, it's good. And what is the YouTube channel? I mean, I'm sure people know, but... Um, it's Neil Guides, N-E-A-L-G-U-I-D-E-S. Perfect. And, of course, Richard Buckley. Also, plenty of tips available, I'm sure, on your Twitch when you're streaming your matches. So, you know, where can, uh, actually it might not be this weekend, but otherwise, where can people find that? Yes, you can find me on uh, all social media at rbuckley98 and also live on Twitch uh, at rbuckley98. Thank you very much for coming on. No, it's been great to have you. And we've also had Japes, as always. Great to have you on this gameplay podcast. Yeah, I wonder whether you'll get some, some extra red picks uh, coming your way after that competition. I hope so. Mm. I mean, I opened them I open them in the morning. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. that sounds sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll be okay. Also, I just checked uh, on my like Jonathan David comment. I've played six matches with him now across like rivals and qualifiers, and he has fourteen goals for me already. Ooh. Nice.
That is not common for me. Yeah, that's really good. Mm. He is. You know, you know what it is? You know who he reminds me of? I'm gonna catch a lot of grief for this. He his finishing is like that R9 loan that I had. Mm. And positioning is the same. He just doesn't have the five star skills. But he feels like a brute. And he his finishing is so much superior to that Marcus Rashford card that I have. And I'm putting it all down to composure. Yeah, indeed. And we should compose ourselves and wrap up this podcast. Thank you very much to all you listeners out there listening to this episode. If you would like these episodes directly into your podcast feed, then do subscribe via the podcast platforms. I think you can ask a question through Spotify these days. So you could do that if you'd like to send something in for a future episode. And if you're on YouTube, you could leave a comment. So that's always good. And you can leave a like too. And of course, subscribe. And if you would like even more Foot Weekly, an extra episode every single week, then it's a great time because not only can you get that, but also that 36,000 FIFA point giveaway is running. So you can find that on the Patreon. Go to bit.ly slash TOTS23. So that's bit.ly slash TOTS23. Link in the description. And you can search Support Foot Weekly. And finally, if you are already supporting, a huge, huge thank you for doing so. It really does keep the podcast going. And a big thank you to, to those Icon patrons. Dave B, Hugh J, Coach Vass, DJ FIFA Player, Alan G, Alistair, Anthony R, Dominic P, Rob P, Jeff B, Stephen F, Tom B, Damon H, David S, Nick Jack M, Eric T, Neil P, Adam G, Dan W, Waterman, N Hagman, Harry A, Jake G, Roger D, Springford, Elec, Bracco, Nishant, Harry P, Alex M, Lee A, Brendan W, Andrew C, Joe W, Timothy J, Dylan, J Kell, Ibis24, Adam R, Sam K, Graham W, Andy, Ads H2K, and Brian V. Plus a special thanks to Luke M, Dave B, Hugh J, Tom M, Darren W, and Pato Foot for advice and production assistance. Before I leave you, just one more thing to add, though. FIFA's a bit like life, really. It has its many ups and its many downs. If you're having a few more downs than ups in real life in these more difficult times, then please don't feel that you're alone or need to struggle on without taking action. If you go to thecalmzone.net, there's loads of resources, advice, support, or even just a friendly chat for anyone who needs it. If it sounds like it could help you, then head over to thecalmzone.net. And for now, have a good one, and I'll catch you on the next podcast.